Despite bans on Russian oil imports by Canada, the U.S., the U.K., and others, Europe, China, and beyond continue to rely heavily on Russian energy exports, even as the war in Ukraine rages on. Canada, as the fourth largest oil producer in the world, has promised to step up to help reduce global reliance on Russian oil, gas, and even uranium for nuclear power. Can this country really make a substantial contribution? Let's ask, in Calgary, Alberta, Stacey McDonald, energy analyst and board member at Birchcliff Energy and Bonterra Energy. In New York, New York, Rachel Ziemba, economic and political risk expert and founder of Ziemba Insights. And in Ontario's capital city, Rory Johnston, commodity analyst who writes a substack called Commodity Context. Welcome everyone to the program tonight. Thanks for having me. All right, so let's get a lay of the land when we talk about the world's top oil producers. I want to pull up a little chart here that will sort of set up the stage here. Starting with the U.S. in navy blue on the left, 20% of the global oil supply comes from them. And working clockwise, the Gulf states, which include the United Arab Emirates, Iran, and Kuwait in green, account for 14% of global oil supply. In indigo, Saudi Arabia accounts for 12%, Russia in purple, 11%, Canada in red, 6%, China in a darker green, 5%, Brazil in orange at 4%, and the remaining 28% in gray is found in smaller amounts across the globe. So my first question to you, I'm going to come to Rachel first. Looking at this pie chart, you would think that Canada, with 6% of the world's oil supply, might be in a good position to replace a significant chunk of what Western countries have vowed to avoid, Russian oil. Is it? Thanks. Thanks for having me. It's a good question. Um, the challenge is that so Canada's already producing a lot. They've already um, in in that way. The challenge is that Canada doesn't have spare capacity ready to go online tomorrow to replace some of this these sort of supplies that we're seeing. And there are sort of uh, limitations that we're seeing in almost any of the other producers. When we look around the world, the only places that really have spare capacity ready to go online in the next couple of days, weeks, months are really in OPEC, uh, the Gulf states in particular. And that's a function of the fact that they've been slow and deliberate in returning oil supply to the market after the pandemic and the, and the demand destruction, but also because they've invested over time and being willing to have more oil sort of ready to go um, so that they can sort of make money in that sort of volatility. So in Canada, like in the U.S., you've got private companies making decisions and they don't necessarily want to invest in having lots of spare capacity on hand in this context. But the bigger question is whether over the next couple of months and years, uh, production can increase. And that's where I think there's we're also there's also the challenge that Canada has of getting uh, the supplies to market. But we should highlight that, of course, Canada has been increasing uh, production, but it faces some of the same labor constraints and supply chain constraints we've been seeing in other sectors. Stacey, I'll, I'll come to you. Um, looking at the, you know, the that pie chart there, 6% of the world's oil supply, can Canada actually fill that void there? I mean, physically speaking, Canada has the reserves to be one of the largest oil producers in the world. The question is, is there a commitment from all levels of government and from the private companies to do that? And what we're seeing now is is a result of seven years of chronic underinvestment in, in Canada's energy sector. Um, frankly, at, these, at this point, outside of maybe 100 or 200,000 barrels a day, it's unlikely that uh, Canada could offset uh, any lost Russian oil supplies. There are a few projects in the works that um, are awaiting approvals from the federal government. There's a large project in Newfoundland, um, and the federal government's held off and delayed a decision on that for uh, twice now. And that project alone could add 200,000 barrels a day and bring much needed jobs to Newfoundland and lots of economic activity. So it's a function of chronic underinvestment because a lot of these projects are long lead items. It's a, it's a, pro it's a product of regulatory uncertainty and delays, and both of those things cannot be fixed quickly. So in terms of adding material supplies, physically, Canada has the reserves to do it, but I think it would take a large commitment from government, and it probably wouldn't be three to five years until we saw those come online. All right, and Rory, I'll get your take on this. Uh, does Canada have what it takes to sort of uh, fill that void as well? 
Yeah, you know, I always like to think of Canada, and I like to say that Canada is one of the you know friendliest, most reliable producers of oil on the planet. Uh, however, we're also one of the slowest. Uh, just by the nature of the, the structure of our oil industry, we have a very, very slow response time. Projects take a long time. We were expecting kind of incremental growth over the next couple of years, uh, over the really through the balance of the decade, um, as a lot of those projects that were already, you know, operational as they began to kind of optimize and de-bottleneck. So there was some of that, but I think when you think about like, like a lot of the conversation about Canadian kind of supply contribution has come in the context of something, like, you know, uh, whether or not the Biden administration should have canceled Keystone XL and whether or not, you know, if that pipeline appeared tomorrow, it could solve the entire Russia crisis. And unfortunately, it just our industry doesn't work like that, unfortunately, if now if the pipeline was built and came into service back in 2012 when it was initially supposed to absolutely we could have filled that that pipeline over that period of time and we would have had much more canadian uh, oil to contribute to the situation right now but unfortunately even if the pipeline appeared tomorrow just like stacy was saying it would take us years to fill the pipeline uh and that's just because you know you need that certainty you need to know that that's going to be there in order to invest up front in order to fill that it's not a conversation about oil and gas if we don't talk about pipelines, but I assure you we will touch on pipelines uh, later on as well, Roy. Uh, Stacy, on this program in the past, uh, when we talk about extracting oil, it's been described as as easy as putting a straw in the ground, and that's as easy as it gets. Um, when we compare that to how uh, Canadian oil works, why is oil in the Middle East so much easier to get to market than Canadian oil? Well, I think it's important to differentiate between what I would call conventional oil, which is large pools of oil, and what is it often associated with Canada, which is oil sands, which is large mining projects and thermal projects or SAG-D. So those projects just typically have a longer lead time from when you start um, you know, construction on the project. So there's a misconception in the public that you know, producers are holding back production and they just open up the taps, which is completely wrong. That's not how the industry works. But when you look at Alberta, you know, even a SAG-D project, if it started today, would take, you know, at least three years before they see first production. So for a producer today to start a new project, to bring on new supplies, to offset, there's a lot of things that need to happen that haven't happened yet and probably won't. So I don't expect to see any large mining projects come on stream Maybe in my lifetime, um, the best Canada could probably do today would be getting some brownfield SAG-D projects up and running and getting started. Rory, I want to come to you. I think a lot of people get confused uh, between the difference between oil, gas, and LNG. And of course, when we talk about LNG, we mean liquefied natural gas. Can you explain the, the difference for us uh, between the three? Yeah, so, you know, oil, obviously, so when you really think about the kind of chemical composition, and really all hydrocarbons are just a gigantic bath of chemicals of hydrogen and carbon atoms, they're functionally the same thing, just at kind of different densities. So oil uh, is, you know, you, you think of oil, it's put into a refinery, you refine it to make diesel and gasoline and everything else. So those are what we call like liquid products. Gas is a lot of the same type of chemistry, but it's just much, much kind of looser hydrocarbons. Uh, and that's, you know, natural gas goes into a pipelines, goes in your house to heat your home, to, you know, work your barbecue or your stove. Um, in terms of a market, the biggest difference is that liquids are much easier to transport than gases are. This is where LNG comes in. It's quite expensive and technically complicated to liquefy natural gas and shrink it on, you know, an order of, you know, 300 fold or 400 fold to get into a tanker to make it economic to transport around the world. And the big result of this is that while we have an extremely global price of oil and market for oil, you know, what's happening in Russia right now is throwing the entire global oil market and our prices into, into a tizzy. The gas market is much more balkanized or regionalized. Uh, so even while we've seen natural gas prices, you know, soar to, you know, you know, unprecedented, wildly high levels in Europe. In North America, we have a much more captive gas market and prices, while higher today, are much lower. And I think that's benefiting us because we're not we're only seeing the oil price and the gasoline price shock. We're not to the same degree seeing a natural gas price shock for Canadians. And to follow up with you, you brought up the market. So I think it's fair we talk, uh, you know, before the war in Ukraine, oil prices were already going up. 
Now, they've skyrocketed. Can you give us an idea of why they were pre-war going up? Yeah, and I think it's really important for people to understand that, you know, the Russia shock is massive, but even before Russia recrossed the border into Ukraine, the oil market was extremely tight. Uh, to give a sense of how tight, last year in 2021, the oil market on balance was undersupplied by about one and a half to two million barrels a day, which is about 2% of global supplies. That was already enough to bring global visible inventory levels, which had reached all time highs at the beginning of the COVID shock, uh, back down to levels we hadn't seen since 2010 to 2014, back when we all generally thought that $100 oil was here to stay forever. So the market was extremely tight. And then you basically took you know, Russia, which is the second or third largest producer neck and neck with Saudi Arabia, potentially a large chunk of it off the market, and you push that tight market into overdrive. All right. I want to talk about a little bit of the big picture here. I'm going to come to Rachel. You know, Canada and the U.S. recently vowed to stop importing uh, Russian crude oil. And I think a lot of Canadians and Americans would sit there, scratch their head, thinking, oh, we import Russian oil. And it should be mentioned that, you know, it was mostly a symbolic gesture on the Canadian side. We haven't really imported crude oil since 2019. Why is Canada in the business of importing Russian oil? Sure. So it's important to, to highlight that the volumes of what Canada was importing were, were very small. Um, and I defer to Rory a little bit on this, who, who's dug through mm -hmm. the very detailed data on this. But what we what, what Canada was importing were oil products, so specific blends. It's the same thing in, in the United States, actually. There's not a lot of crude oil that the United States was importing from Russia, but there are blending fuels, particular sort of grades that are um, that, that, that are sort of mixed into oil products. Now, in the U.S. case, what was going on was, in a sense, sanctions on Venezuela, dynamics and negotiation with Saudi Arabia, other things going on in part a function of U.S. foreign policy were actually increasing Russia's market share. Now, we want to put in, in context here, even for the U.S. that was importing some blending fuels, you were sort of, they were looking at, you know, about 5% of oil, um, oil and oil product imports are coming from Russia. Uh, about half of U.S. Uh, oil and oil product imports come from Canada, back to the point about uh, Canada being a reliable supplier. So this was a smaller amount. Um, in that context. And it's really a function of the fact that oil and oil products are, are global, that no matter how much is produced at, at home, uh, there are, um, that's a global market. In the U.S. context, unlike Canada, um, some of the biggest buyers of Russian oil were places like Hawaii, right, where mm -hmm. all the sort of oil and gas that comes in has to be uh, by sea, right? There's not a pipeline to get it there. And in the U.S. context, there's a rule called the Jones Act that makes it very difficult and more costly to send any goods from a U.S. port to another U.S. port. Um, it, you have to use uh, U.S. ships and U.S. personnel, and it's, it's, it's a legacy of the early 20th century. And so for some of those buyers, it was much more economical to buy from Russia than to buy from what was fairly far away in the Gulf, in the Gulf Coast of, of the United States. So those dynamics are, you know, very much those policy choices, whether foreign policy imposing sanctions on Venezuela um, or uh, economic policy of trying to support the U.S. shipbuilding industry uh, have an impact there. Now, the rest of the world, um, big Asian countries, uh, energy companies in Europe, uh, they were much more reliant on, on Russian oil and gas. And they're having a lot of questions now about whether they can pare down they don't want to buy Russian oil and gas right now, um, but they also don't want to. Um, they don't want to pass on uh, the extreme costs and volatility to their buyers. Uh, Rory, I'm going to get some Canadian context because I know you recently looked into this as well. Um, when we look at sort of the ban, who's the biggest loser here in Canada? Yeah, and and Rachel nailed it on the head. You know, we are talking about very small kind of volumes in the scheme of things. Uh, and you said that the last crude oil that was purchased was in 20, 2019 in September. And that was interestingly, so the last place and really the dominant place that was buying uh, Russian crude oil, much in the same way that Rachel mentioned for Hawaii, was Newfoundland Labrador. And that was the come by chance oil refinery um, in Newfoundland Labrador that was buying those barrels 
Uh, and that was, again, because that was just a convenient way for them to get that type of crude. Now, at the beginning of the pandemic, that uh, refinery shut down because of economic reasons. And what you've seen is essentially since that point, we haven't imported a single more drop of Russian crude oil. Now, what we have continued to import is about 10,000 barrels a day. And just put in perspective, relative to a Canadian overall consumption of more in the ballpark of you know 1.8 million barrels a day. But of that 10,000 barrels a day, most of it is gasoline and most of it's going to Quebec. So if you're talking about the single biggest loser, I guess the, you know, the answer there would likely be Quebec uh, and Quebec motorists. But again, we're talking about relatively small uh, volumes of crude, or sorry, uh, relatively small volumes of gasoline. So really, you know, it's it, we're only going to probably talk, you know, a couple cents on the barrel likely of the difference. So I think it's it's mostly, you know, as you said at the beginning, symbolic. But it was, you know, Canada was the first one to ban these uh, these imports, and since then we've seen the U.S., the U.K., and Australia follow suit. So I think it was a an important signal. All right, I'm going to tap into Rachel. You're a political risk expert, so I'm going to ask you this, and Stacey, I'm hoping you can follow up on this. Uh, Canada and the U.S. are the only two countries in that uh, earlier pie chart that can be considered sort of thriving democracies. And yes, as we mentioned, it's sort of a dirtier product, but geopolitically speaking, it's a, it's a safer product. Does that seem to matter at all? I think it, it's mattering more now than it might have mattered uh, a couple of months and, and years ago, um, you know, in that context. I know many in the Canadian oil patch and, and, and the like have highlighted this sort of, uh, cle you know, politically cleaner energy sort of question. I think the challenge that Canadian fuel has faced is that as there's been a decarbonization push globally, as there's been a focus on all of the energy required to get out the molecules, Stacy highlighted that this, that most of the energy produced in Canada is unconventional and that requires a lot of inputs, that there's been this sort of d divergence, especially in Europe, um, which has been really pushing on decarbonization, the concern about that, well, we might like cleaner politically, but we'd really prefer cleaner um, environmentally and the lo lower costs. So as there's been this push of where to use the carbon budget, that's been a real uh, a real challenge. Now, the Canadian producers and the governments have, have listened to some extent. There's been much more focus on trying to think about how to clean the, the, the life cycle of um, oil and gas products. Um, you know, there's a good question marks about how far that can go. But I do think this sort of question mark about where this fits with the energy transition and some of the very difficult sort of political debates around carbon taxes and the like in Canada, at least hopefully have, have forced industry to sort of adjust to what's really a, a global re reality here. So ultimately, I think the interest and in, we see that, but we see politically some of the situations have you know, have changed. We saw the Biden administration with European allies sort of basically commit to uh, Europe buying more natural gas um, from the U.S. over a long term. That is partly this Biden administration focus on having democracies work. The interesting sort of puzzle to me, in a sense, is um, sort of why Canada is not sort of part and parcel of some of those discussions. And that reflects some of the things that Stacey and Rory, you know, have said. But ultimately, I think what we're what what we're now facing is a challenge of both matching this sort of short-term urgent resupply of, of fuel, making sure the global economy um, tries to avoids a recession in the context of this shock, with also meeting the long-term goals of reducing uh, the risk of a, of a shock like this happening again, but also trying to meet these longer-term uh, energy transition goals. And it's it's hard to get all of those, you know, sort of catch all those balls that are in here. All right, Stacey, I'll get I'll get your take on that. Does it seem to matter that you know this product's a bit is dirtier, but uh, geopolitically a little safer? I mean, it shouldn't matter. Ultimately, I think what's going on in Russia has shown that, you know, energy security ultimately will come first for the population. I mean, the ability to heat your home and have food is going to be first and foremost above, uh, you know, citizens' long-term desires to reduce carbon emissions. So what I think has happened here is it's, I mean, it's highlighted the fact that policymakers have restricted supply, but demand hasn't gone down. And now we're in a position with 
with a supply shortfall and dealing with some bad actors. So I think there needs to be a lot of introspection from policymakers across, um, you know, Western democracies on, you know, it's one thing to beat down industry to restrict supply, but if demand doesn't go down, these issues are going to keep happening and they're going to keep getting worse. And the demand reduction forecasts are just not realistic with what's been happening in the real world. So if I'm the gov if I'm a Western government, I would much rather have stable, reliable production from Canada and the U.S. than relying on countries like Venezuela, Iran, and Russia. And I think policymakers need to be really honest about that because ultimately, if demand doesn't go down, um, the supply has to come from somewhere. And this is what we call carbon leakage. So if it's not coming from Canada, it's going to come from an unsavory place. So Canadians and Canadian policymakers need to acknowledge that fact. And I think that's been left out of the energy transition for a long time. Rory, I want to come to you uh, with this conflict in Ukraine. Do you think this will speed up or hinder the switch to clean energy? You know, I think it's it's going to do both in in a funny way. Um, you know, I think on one hand, it's definitely going to accelerate the transition just because higher prices or all else equal are going to reduce demand faster than lower prices. And what we're seeing coming out of the Russia-Ukraine crisis is it seems like kind of higher prices, all, you know, for a longer period of time. I think, you know, to just to pivot back a little bit to blend this in with this discussion of energy security, I think, you know, what I've been pushing for a long time is, is exactly as Stacy was saying, you know, a focus on demand reduction. I, you know, I, I can, you can envision a future where Canada, Canada, as an example, consumes far less uh, oil products, but is is producing and exporting far more. And I think that, you know, it, it's a double whammy. We, we, we can increase our production and reduce our, our consumption that increases our relative export size on the global stage. And I think my hope coming out of this crisis is that, you know, policymakers recognize that it's not just, you know, a, a pure carbon accounting uh, exercise when you look at a global kind of interconnected system, what we're seeing, particularly coming out of COVID, is this kind of decoupling of the global system. And I think that you need to take into account more than just a single carbon vector. You need to take into account security of supply. You need to take into account kind of, you know, uh, political realities in the countries when factoring for how kind of um, optimal those, those barrels are in your overall mix. I see some head nodding from both. I'll go to Stacey. Uh, what is your take in, in terms of this moment now when we have a war? Uh, do we go clean or do we sort of go back and, and stay where, stay put sort of and, and rely on fossil fuels? Um, you know, similar to what Rory said, I think high prices um, support additional low carbon technologies. Um, but ultimately, I think it will set, set the energy transition back. I think that, um, you know, if, if this results in higher fuel costs, higher food costs. Um, I think that the politicians and policymakers have a chance of losing the support of the population for some of these energy transition uh, initiatives. And frankly, that's probably the right call because higher food costs and higher gasoline costs are regressive and they, they really hurt low income people. And um, I think first and foremost, um, you know, we need to focus on, on supply and the energy security that goes along with it. So I do think ultimately um, it'll hurt some of these energy transition initiatives because I don't think the population is going to support the way it's been going if it keeps if this keeps happening. And Rachel, I'll get your take. Anything to add on to that? Yeah, I think the only thing I would add, you know, as part of this kind of energy and political security piece is that we are already seeing, and we'll probably see more um, gas tax holidays or sort of cuts to prices trying to smooth that for consumers for the very reasons that, you know, sort of, you know, for the very reasons we were just talking about. The challenge was that is that if anything, it might boost demand or, or keep demand level. So there needs to be kind of a broader assessment sort of on supply and demand and longer term trajectory. So there's a risk that in addressing the short term political challenges, which I completely agree are, are very real um, in Canada and around the world, um, but also sort of being realistic about how are we going to meet that demand. And in some ways, the situation 
situation we find ourselves in now, which was already building at the end of last year, particularly in Europe and in parts of Asia, was that we have a sort of a narrative about moving away from fossil fuels, but consumers that were still still demanding it. And price-driven demand destruction is a pretty painful way to sort of adjust in, in that way. Um, and so down the line, and and this sort of broader point around food security is a really pain, you know, sort of important one. Um, we're already seeing sort of higher natural gas prices feed into less natural, natural gas-based fertilizer, those couple with potash-related fertilizer sort of reductions out of Russia and uh, Russia and Belarus because of sanctions that might be good for Canadian sort of producers, um, but there's still really a challenge. All these systems are interconnected. And so I think being really realistic about sending the signals in the short term, but also investing for the long term and realizing that that's sort of just um, uh, adding more restrictions and and in that, in that way doesn't doesn't get us to um, doesn't get us to uh, a, a stable more secure uh, system. As I promised, we would talk about pipelines, so this is the time to talk about it. I'm gonna I'm gonna come to Stacy. You know, one of Canada's biggest obstacles in getting oil to market is pipelines and, and the infrastructure there. And it's a, a question that we've asked so many times on this program in the past. Why is it so hard to build pipelines in Canada? I mean, frankly, what kills most of these projects is time. Um, you know, if you're looking at building a new large egress pipeline, um, you know, you have to look at capital, um, shipping, but ultimately projects in Canada just take significantly longer to get done than they do in the US. And increased time increases regulatory risk and it increases the cost of capital. So um, just one example, there's been a couple of reports, but um, you know, building an LNG project in Canada um, comparable to a US project takes on average 19 months longer. Um, companies just don't want to build in Canada because they don't have regulatory certainty and they don't have timeline certainty. So that's the biggest thing um, that hurts in Canada. And it's extremely frustrating to see because the important thing Canada can do is we have the resources. We just need to connect the supply to the market. So it's very frustrating. Uh, Rory, I'll get your take on that. And I, I do want to add a little follow up in there. You know, is it sort of uh, a, a, a change in how we view pipelines as well, more as a, as a vessel instead of the product? Like when we talk about clean energy, is there, if we put that infrastructure in and, you know, the investments there that, you know, Canada might reap some benefits later down the line as well? Yeah, and I, I think it's, you know, everything that Stacey was saying is absolutely 100%, you know, on point. And to your point about how these pipelines, one of the worst things that happened to the overall oil industry, and particularly the Canadian industry, is that pipelines move from boring infrastructure projects like highways to these kind of symbolic um, battlegrounds for the future of the global climate. And obviously, you get a lot of kind of complexity, you know, flattened down into this one particular project. But I mean, what we're seeing right now, interestingly, is that for the first time in almost a full decade, we've we, we've seen the Canadian industry actually at this exact moment, you know, not pipeline constrained. We have very, very small differentials. We haven't needed to rely on rail. It's because we've got the Enbridge Line 3 expand, you know, um, uh, replacement project that's, that's uh, finally come on stream. We're going to be getting the Trans Mountain Expansion Project online hopefully anytime now into 2023, maybe early 2024. But I think when you think about the future and you think about the ability for Canadian industry to grow production and these, these kind of um, good friendly barrels kind of continuing to increase market share, the challenge is it's hard to imagine a private entity like Tran, you know, TC Energy, what used to be TransCanada or Enbridge or, or Kinder Morgan or any of the major pipeline companies, it's hard to imagine them staking a, a considerable commercial risk on um, you know, building a, a new pipeline across the border again. It's, it's just so impossible to achieve. So what, we've, what we saw with the Trans Mountain Expansion Pipeline was obviously Ottawa effectively nationalized the pipeline, took it, it, took it under federal ownership, uh, effectively exercised uh, kind of federal uh, supremacy here and, and its ability to push through some of the provincial bottlenecks that we're facing, uh, you know, between Alberta and BC, for instance. And I, and I, I, you know, for better or worse, I wonder if the future of pipeline construction in Canada is going to be one of nationalized projects that are effectively owned 
uh, operated by the government until such time that they are done, and then they can be resold to the private sector to manage. And I think that is not going to be a comfortable reality for many people in the industry, but I think that that if, we're, if we get another pipeline after Transmountain expansion, at this, at this point right now, I think that's probably the way it's going to look. Uh, Rachel, I'm going to come to you. It's a, it's a pipeline that I didn't think we would be talking about, the, the Keystone. thought it was done in 2021. Uh, and maybe I'm joking here, but is the Keystone really dead forever, or, is, or does this change things at all? <laughs> well, never never say never. I mean, I think a lot of people in the industry and in Canadian government have, uh, so, you know, have, have a lot more uh, gray hairs um, as a result of the pipeline. Um, so, I mean, on the one hand, never say never. On the other hand, I do think that the political sort of capital and other things like that, um, it's not clear to me that there's the political will to sort of, you know, revive that. Um, it's been notable to me, yes, there have been uh, U.S., um, you know, in a sense, the very same people in the U.S. who were against killing it in the first place at the beginning of last year have come out and said, well, this could be, you know, sort of the solution. I think kind of focusing in on other issues, other ways of getting this sort of fuel to market, and maybe even other ways of uh, coordination and bilateral relationships in this way might be, you know, sort of might be more fruitful. The issue, though, is I think focusing in on areas of broader, you know, sort of, you know, broader, longer term interest. I mean, the issue, the, the sort of issues that are faced on a, a bilateral basis around not just oil and gas, but also power exports and the like, of course, are, are politically fraught. And navigating this in a context where, yes, the U.S. wants reliable uh, energy, but also is moving towards much more sort of onshoring in a variety of areas. And so I think there's an element for Canada even in the energy sector of sort of picking battles and, uh, you know, particularly on um, uh, in infrastructure projects that are closer to sort of being done or nearer sort of payouts. In the last sort of two minutes that I, that I have, I, I do want to ask this question, uh, Stacy and Rory. Um, I'll, I'll start with Stacy. What are the lessons you hope our leaders uh, are, are taking away from the war in Ukraine as it pertains to Canadian oil and gas? I mean, I think that the biggest lesson they should see is that, I mean, Russia was able to use their energy resources politically and in a way where they could ex uh, go into Ukraine. Canada has a role to play here, especially on the LNG side. I mean, we have some of the largest natural gas resources in the world, and we would have the ability to ship LNG to Europe from the East Coast to Canada and to Asia from, from the West Coast. Um, over the last 10 years, the Americans have built probably 10 LNG projects. And over the last 15 years, um, we'll be lucky to get one done. So if anything, I think Canada contributes um, resources to market that can stabilize both in Asia and in Europe. So um, Canada does have a role to play here, but it's going to take a commitment from all levels of government to get our safe, reliable uh, resources to market. All right. And Rory, what are the lessons our leaders can take away from sort of what's going on when we talk about uh, what's happening in Ukraine when it comes to Canadian oil and gas? I think the biggest thing to take into consideration here is that this industry moves very slow. Uh, we need to be very, very purposeful, very, very thoughtful and forward looking in our decisions. You know, I think uh, after oil prices collapsed in 2014, as an example, um, you, you know, a lot of people more or less wrote the industry off, uh, that this wasn't something that needed, you know, love and care anymore. It was just something that was going to more or less keep producing until we didn't need it anymore because everything was electrified. And I think that set up a false sense of security um, about kind of the effort uh, and risks inherent in that energy transition. We are undeniably heading towards a decarbonized net zero future. But the path, you know, the drive along that bridge to transition is going to be fueled in many cases by gasoline and diesel until we've fully displaced those fuels from our mix. Um, and I think even just to tie it back momentarily to the um, to the pipeline conversation, as as Rachel pointed out, it's not just oil and gas pipelines. It's power. It's power lines down to New England. It's everything. And and you know, if you think that the oil and gas, the traditional hydrocarbon 
uh, you know, economy is particularly, you know, infrastructure intense, you know, just wait until you see, uh, you know, the renewable energy kind of grid. It's going to be much more energy uh, infrastructure intense. You're going to need much more physical infrastructure involved through the entire system to make it work. And we're going to need to get to a stage where we're comfortable building kind of big mega infrastructure projects again uh, in North America, in Canada, and across our border in order to facilitate that necessary transition. Rachel, Rory, Stacy, thank you so much. Great discussion, great insights. I felt like I learned a lot. Thank you for joining us on the program tonight. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.